So we're going to turn now to yet another lens on governance and regulation of cybersecurity and privacy. Uh, and as Rachel shared, at CLTC, we put a lot of emphasis on being a two-way bridge between research at Berkeley and the issues that practitioners are grappling with in industry and government. Uh, so it's my great pleasure uh, that distinguished guest, Dr. Amit Elazari, is joining us today for a conversation about what she is seeing in the field and how that connects to Berkeley researchers and academic research more broadly. Uh, so Amit is the Director of Global Cybersecurity Policy at Intel and a lecturer in the School of Information's Master of Information and Cybersecurity Program. She graduated with her Doctor of Science of the Law from the UC Berkeley School of Law. During her time at Berkeley, she was a CLTC grantee, as well as a member of the Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Working Group, known as AFOG. Her research interests include privacy, security, cyber law, copyright, patents, and private ordering and intellectual property. Her work has been published in leading journals and popular news outlets, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, and Wall Street Journal, and she has presented in top security and intellectual property conferences, including RSA, Black Hat, Usenix Enigma, DEF CON, and many more. Uh, so we are going to start with a few prepared questions, and then we'll leave time for Q&A. So for folks in the audience, please feel free to start asking questions in the Q&A box, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so welcome, Amit. Thank you so much. So first of all, let me ask if you can all uh, hear me well. Yep, hear you great. Great, wonderful. Well, this is so exciting, uh, especially for me. Um, I, I, you know, I'm so inspired by the work CLTC uh, has been doing in this field. And um, I've, you know, recently also seen firsthand, you know, the connection between CLTC research, which is interdisciplinary in its kind of core nature and how it can potentially, um, you know, impact conversation that we are now seeing. So I can just share from my personal experience and I'm going to be talking about, you know, my prior work uh, as part of uh, Berkeley and CLTC, but uh, one of the projects that CLTC has supported is uh, my work around uh, private ordering uh, mechanisms to facilitate safe harbor for security researchers. And uh, uh, just academically speaking, I've recently seen that work being cited in, in some of the briefs uh, that have been submitted on a um, Supreme Court case on the matter. Uh, and it's just, you know, obviously this is academic work that I was doing as part of Berkeley, but you just see the connection and the nexus between uh, the ability to have collaborations between people coming from the law school, people coming from the School of Information, political science, policy thinkers, technologies, uh, and the, with the CS experts, the ICSI experts like Serge Egelman, uh, my great collaborator and his team uh, there. And you just see how that type of conversations that CLTC is facilitating between different disciplinaries is actually um, getting potentially implemented or uh, broadly kind of uh, referenced and uh, leading conversations that are very much uh, top of mind. Uh, so just from a personal perspective, um, CLTC is very dear to heart. And I just wanted to highlight that, you know, this type of work, especially if we are looking into the future, uh, it certainly is clear that security is a conversation that is multifaceted. Uh, and academic research is absolutely critical for that. So I think CLTC is just uh, so well positioned to connect uh, leaders across uh, and thinkers across these issues from different disciplines together. And it is that dialogue, that mutual conversation and collaboration between different disciplines that is going to be continue, th that is, will continue and be critical for security. So just wanted to share uh, my personal uh, thanks for, for uh, uh, the great work that CLTC is doing and Anne and Steve and everybody from my perspective. Uh, and with that, uh, let's kick the discussion. Thanks so much, Amit. Yeah, and it's great to hear that some of the research that you did while you were at Berkeley is being cited in high places and having a real world impact. 
And I think, you know, you're the perfect person for this conversation because you've been straddling the research and the industry side for a while now. And you know exactly what it's like to be standing in the shoes of any of today's presenters. Um, but can you share a little bit about what you're doing now since um, you finished up at Berkeley and maybe just a little bit about what drew you to cybersecurity in the first place and what gets you up in the morning? Yeah, well, thank, thank you so much, you know. Um, um, so I've been um, doing work on, on policy and cybersecurity uh, at Intel for almost the past two years. Um, I'm a, also a principal engineer now. Uh, I'm, I'm one of the directors in our, you know, uh, policy uh, government affairs team. Um, and uh, I'm mostly focusing on working with, you know, policymakers around the world and also our technical experts on kind of uh, looking at the evolving landscape of technology uh, law and policy from, you know, intellectual property, privacy, security, um, and working closely on basically informing uh, how policy standards, best practices are being developed and sharing a little bit of the insights. Uh, we have certainly seen uh, the importance that technology plays in everyone's life, especially, you know, with the, with the pandemic, uh, I think it's, it's uh, clearer than ever that the resilience of, you know, the networks, the infrastructure, everything that we're working on, uh, and just the play, the, the, the role that technology plays in connecting everybody and enabling everybody is uh, going to continue and grow. And it's uh, an exciting time to be in technology and uh, kind of, uh, um, you know, impacting everyone's life. Uh, but but with that, you know, there are obviously challenges and there are um, uh, policymakers are considering, uh, for example, uh, issues around information sharing, issues around the resilience of the of the network and the like. And uh, there is an important element of, you know, private uh, par public partnership in this regard. And a lot of the work uh, that, you know, at least from a perspective of, you know, what my own personal kind of life, uh, I invest in, um, you know, facilitating and drafting international standards and informing the development of best practices on issues like IoT security and the security of embedded devices, on issues like code and vulnerability disclosure uh, and the like, uh, because among others, it is that collaboration between industry and between uh, you know uh, the government and policymakers and the relevant authorities that is supporting also uh, the resilience and the, the promotion of uh, security best practices. Uh, so this is just some of the things that I've been uh, personally kind of involved in. Uh, but I think um, on the other hand, uh, I've been working very closely uh, with uh, our, our robust organizations around security on facilitating uh, relationships uh, with the ecosystem, with the researcher uh, ecosystem. And everybody recognizes, obviously, in industry, uh, the important uh, uh, role of the community, the academic community, in advancing uh, security. Uh, and this is everything from uh, funding. Uh, so you, you can imagine that industry is very active in uh, make, trying to uh, support academic uh, funding for top uh, kind of research in this field. We do this through Intel Labs, but it's also through frameworks like bug bounties, uh, which are uh, kind of private um, frameworks to incentivize research, uh, offensive research in particular areas where you can actively see how uh, companies are uh, reaching out to the uh, ecosystem, including the eco eco academic ecosystem, uh, and actively inviting researchers to uh, submit uh, potential vulnerabilities uh, to help, um, you know, the resilience and help uh, inform and support security. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think you make a great point, right? The cybersecurity landscape was already, already, always changing. And amid COVID, it's changing even more. Um, and I think it'd be really interesting for this audience, if we could drill down a little bit into the kinds of public private partnerships that you mentioned, um, what are you seeing? Which ones are you most excited about? Or do you think have the most promise to effectively meet policy priorities? I mean, we, I think what's exciting is we have seen, you know, policymakers around the world reaching out very actively to industry seeking input on 
you know, what are the biggest obstacles? What are the challenges we have seen particular bills that looking that are looking into uh, funding, not just IT, IT modernization more generally, but specifically looking into supporting security capabilities and cybersecurity resilience capabilities as part of the discussions from, you know, technology to services and whatnot. Uh, and there have been numerous efforts around the role in this regard. Uh, I think among others, we have seen specific uh, efforts to collaborate uh, on information sharing with respect to threats, uh, you know, the threats that are most prominent. Uh, and this is really leveraging uh, um, infrastructure that has been there for years uh, at place when it comes to uh, inform voluntary information sharing on threats uh, between private, uh, between industry and, and policymakers, things like the ISACs, uh, information sharing centers and the like. So that is being leveraged and kind of reinforced. Uh, and when it comes to particular challenges in security, I think uh, th those kind of public-private um, partnerships uh, on information sharing uh, are exciting. Uh, we also have seen a lot of work also promoted by the trade associations, BSA is an example, but others on making resource available on security and educating, helping educating the community at large on security best practices. So we need to recognize that, you know, the resilience of the network or these issues that are top of mind for infrastructure, um, we also need to make, make those resources accessible to many, many communities. So for example, as part of the work uh, Intel has been doing uh, on COVID and supporting, um, you know, teachers and just users around, there are this specific security guidance then training that I believe we included in that this is just one example. You have seen companies and trade associations and many other bodies around the world um, making more and more uh, education resource around usability and around sec security accessible to, to many communities. I think what's very much, um, you know, one of the top things we are seeing in terms of the policy conversation uh, with, with the importance reliance on technology, we are going to see an importance reliance on international standards and best practices. Uh, so the connection there, because of the global nature of the supply chain, because of the global nature uh, of, of this threat sometimes, uh, the connection between the development of technology, the development of innovations, and the innovations are critical to solve our problem. They're going to go hand in hand with policies and they're going to go hand in hand with research, of course, ongoing research. But with that, the infrastructure to support it is interoperability is making sure that the systems can work together in a design neutral manner. And that's where uh, standards and best practices and the like are coming, are really playing a key role. Uh, and I think academia, you know, has a real uh, important play to, uh, a really important uh, play to role there. Role to play, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, you just mentioned so many things that are, are near and dear to our hearts. I know, you know, usability and accessibility are such strengths of the Berkeley cybersecurity research community um, and something that we care about a lot. Um, obviously, uh, the supply chain issue is a very hot topic nowadays. Um, uh, I think particularly you've been doing some work on IoT, which is really relevant um, in the COVID era. Um, so kind of knowing what you just said about the importance of interoperability and how important it is for security, um, it's great to hear that those things are being considered, but, um, you know, how are policymakers considering those issues right now based on your work and your conversations and, um, do you see places where there's, there's promise where the world has been coming together? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you bring a, a great case study. You know, we do see how particular threats, and in this regard, uh, this is a little bit past looking, but, you know, the Mirai attack, specific attacks in the past that were really a DDoS attack or other attacks leveraging potentially accessible devices, um, reliant on default passwords, right, have informed policymakers around the world to, you know, take a particular threat and consider legislation around it. Um, and IoT security has been one of the most, I would say, involving uh, policy landscape. Again, just academically speaking, we have seen proposed regulations. We do have uh, laws in California and Oregon on connected devices 
uh, security. Uh, there is a proposed legislation in the UK. Uh, we had one. We have one federal bill that passed the House just, I believe, this month, uh, the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act. Uh, and, the, and specifically, uh, the work done in the U.S. government in the recent Cyber Solarium Commission report, the COVID annex. So they've came back to the report yeah, yeah. after COVID and actually uh, released a specific annex uh, and legislative proposed language. One of their recommendations was an older market IoT um, security uh, legislation. Uh, and I think what's interesting is you see you see a potential threat and then you see all of industry coming together because it's, this is such a complex landscape. If you think about IoT devices, you have so the difference between the business model and the verticals, right? We have everything from the dog collar to the, to the sophisticated, um, you know, uh, critical infrastructure, you know, devices or, or whatnot, medical devices and the like. So you have such a, such a variance in terms of the business model, the economic models, uh, the, the technology itself, the device constraints, right? In terms of the, the whatever the, you know, the compute and the power and whatnot. And then on top of that, you have a really evolving threat model and different verticals of threats for all of these kind of, uh, you know, different sectors. So from a policy perspective, um, industry has been working very hard to develop consensus driven standards and reports uh, and basically an approach on IoT security, baseline security capabilities. And this is work being, you know, this is work in development for the last couple of years. Now it's being referenced actually in potential proposed regulation, like the work being, being done at NIST and NIST 8259, like the work being uh, done by uh, an effort called C2, which is a consensus effort for almost the entire uh, you know, US uh, industry. If you look at the trade associations led by the Council to Secure the, D the Digital Economy, uh, and now there is an international standard. I'm one of the editors in development on IoT security uh, device capabilities at ISO IEC. So you can see how industry is working together to develop approaches around what are the baseline capabilities for security of IoT devices. And these are capabilities like security update, device identification, and the like. And those can be leveraged internationally in an interoperable uh, manner because they are developed in the, the international sphere in standards that can develop with time, right? As the landscape changes, we can go and amend standards as opposed to laws and legislation, which are often harder to amend. Uh, and if you get over prescriptive or non-design neutral, potentially you might not be able to support some of the challenges that are on the horizon, not just right now, right? And the technologies that are on the horizon. So the IoT security conversation is just a really good example on how industry comes together to develop a consensus, to solve real world problem um, and, you know, creating a, poten a potential solution that is applicable international. And we do have a lot of standards on security on many verticals specifically like uh, industrial 62443 or other verticals. But this work being that at ISO IEC is really horizontal across the market to all IoT devices. Wow, yeah, that's, that's so interesting, Amit. And um, I wanna ask you two more questions actually to your point about what you see coming over the horizon, and then a slightly more parochial question about um, the research questions that, that you think you know, the Berkeley community should be focusing on critically. Um, so we'll do that, but while we're, we're doing those two questions, just wanna encourage people to continue to put any Q&A you have um, in the Q&A box, and we'll turn to those questions next. Um, but so me getting, to, but getting to the first question about looking further over the horizon, um, what are your hunches about how the global security policy and legal landscape will develop post COVID? I mean, obviously the world is just becoming more reliant on digital infrastructure, compute and connectivity. So yeah, what does this look like in three to five years in, in your point of view? Yeah, you know, this is such a broad um, question. And, you know, again, speaking from my personal perspective here, um, and, and just sharing for my kind of prior uh, um, prior work and kind of from my uh, experience working with CLTC and the Berkeley community specifically, um, I do feel like 
it's very clear that the role technology is going to play is going to continue is going to continue and grow it's very clear that security is an essential part of that conversation and you know with with the connectivity and with the growing reliance on technology security is going to continue security and privacy are going to continue to be top of mind uh, specifically I think uh, we are all excited about making you know technology accessible and I feel that there are two and I'm, I'm really talking here um, about the role um, Ber the Berkeley community and CLC, CLTC has to play here. Uh, those kind of conversations and issues that are top of mind are going to need to be tackled uh, both collaboratively, industry collaborating with policymakers, collaborating with, uh, you know, researchers, collaborating with academia. It's all it's going to be all about coming together and the collaboration and the dialogue. We're going to need multiple lenses to look at issues. Some many of the problems uh, are going to be uh supported by technology and innovation we're going to drive the innovation that's important but there is there, there is there is a, uh, an important thread of you know usability and making uh, all of that goodness usable for you know diverse communities and communities around the world uh, and i think continuing and thinking about the importance of developing the workforce education uh, pipeline uh, and and usability which i know is a big thread of work where cltc is bringing together experts from different communities across berkeley uh, i'm very inspired uh, to have you know to know this research is happening because i think that's what we were probably going to need uh, as, as we move forward, right? Just from our own personal perspective. Um, and I think we yeah. have seen it uh, during the pandemic more than ever. Yeah. Um, you know, again, I think we're, we're a big plus one to the point you're making about more research into usability and accessibility and something we talk about sometimes as understandable security. Um, but I know, you know, you and I had been chatting uh, earlier just a little bit about other critical research questions that you see. And I'd love if you would just share a little bit more about research questions you see, I think, in um, privacy preserving machine learning. And um, I think you have some thoughts potentially about the kind of education and pipeline as well. Yeah, uh, you know, I think these are key two key areas. I mean, we have seen, obviously, um, um, Technologies around PPML can serve uh, as an enabler, and I think that 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 will continue. And there is, um, you know, great work done by CNTC in this CLTC in that area. Certainly, um, you know, um, open research and the pandemic has caused some policymakers to actually issue different, you know, refinements to regulations in this area. Uh, but it will continue and, and be a, a very important uh, area of, of uh, academic work and uh, industry work as well. Um, I do think that, you know, when I was thinking about the, this issue of, of um, accessibility, one of the key issues is how can we uh, continue and drive research around areas of education. Uh, and I shared with you, Anne, that I think sometimes, and again, speaking here as an academic, actually not, you know, in the industry capacity, if you look at the traditional uh, publications and conferences, uh, we are seeing more and more promotion of interdisciplinary work, but we also know that the prominent uh, venues are often also still are very much geared towards, you know, uh, if you will, the focus area or the core area of the discipline. So if it would be security, mm -hmm. if you look at the publications in the prominent CS converse, uh, conferences like, you know, USNIX or whatnot, it's still very much in the core. Uh, but one of the key, you know, uh, important kind of, I think, insights uh, from a pipeline or from education perspective is how you make you know how do you develop that talent around the world to help you solve you know complex issues and you know for example uh, if you think about external security researchers you know how much it is important to collaborate with that ecosystem and we have seen crowdsourced solutions and i'm again talking here about empire work like bug bounties uh, enabling people from all over the world for the first time without any education on security participate often in a legal manner, depending on, on of course, the, the language and the conditions, uh, and getting paid for their skill sets. And that, that is exciting. So how can we create more research on how do you make um, security accessible and, sec and the bar to get into security uh, lower and lower while continuing to drive the education in this area, while, while continuing to drive the workforce development? I think, I think these are key research academic uh, these are key questions. They should be explored for everyone. I mean, I personally and industry is very involved in that. But these are 
policymakers for sure. Uh, but these are also important conversations to think about from an academic perspective. And uh, that's where CLTC and specifically uh, researchers uh, that are coming from different disciplines together, like like the, in the platform the CLTC is creating can play a key role. Because I think we should all ask ourselves whether the academic system from a publication at this perspective is promoting that uh, as much as we can. I think we are, are seeing some, you know, really prominent uh, cross-discipline um, uh, conferences that are that are like Fat Star, that's a great example, that are definitely kind of, you know, um, uh, surfacing up. Uh, but still, it would be the role of academic institutions like you, I think, uh, to pull the pieces together and pull the disciplines together to address key questions like that. Re really well said, and, and thank you for saying it. Um, you know, certainly we have striven to be a place where, you know, we can have people coming from all over campus uh, into the field of cybersecurity and um, make it something that everybody sees a place for themselves in. Um, and actually on that note, I mean, we have a question in the Q&A that I'm going to go to. Um, I don't know if you have a perspective on this, uh, but the, the questioner is asking, uh, I'm wondering if you can describe how partnerships with other schools, such as the College of Environmental Design or the School of Public Health, are addressing edge, commuting, edge computing and embodiment, um, perhaps in terms of critical infrastructure breakdowns, communication, violence, uh, and possible cyber persistence and resilience. Um, so uh, I, I think um, you know the question raises the the important role the important role of the interdisciplinary you know uh, lens uh, that is needed to address issues around uh, security. I don't know specifically um, um, uh, the collaboration. Maybe Anne, you're better suited to answer this in terms of what the CLTC specific collaborations with that particular school. But I can certainly say that generally speaking. Uh, uh, there, there is a nexus between sustainability uh, and between questions that are specific to that vertical uh, and security. You have seen, for example, uh, great collaborations through either the energy ISACs or uh, conversations that are, you know, coming from utility uh, and um, looking at, you know, how these come to play when it comes to IoT device security, specifically the work that I am, um, you know, uh, leading or I'm, I'm an editor, so I'm not really, I'm, you know, I'm make my role there is as an editor, but certainly industry has been involved in when it comes to IoT security capabilities. Uh, utilities and that sector is one of the key verticals um, that are potentially, you know, uh, there is a lot of room and a lot of uh, actually promise when it comes to innovations. If you think about the grid modernization and uh, the, the ability to kind of uh, uh, support uh, security through software and through other so then hardware and other solutions, uh, there has been a lot of work being done on standards to uh, for example, do secure device onboarding uh, and other technical elements. So I do feel, uh, I do think that there is a clear connection between the disciplines and, uh, and maybe Anne, you can shed, out, shed light a little bit. I think we have seen one research on municipality just before I joined, but uh, you can shed light on some of the other researcher uh, kind of interaction uh, that, that CLTC is supporting in that regard. Yeah, I agree with that, Amit, and, and I'd be happy to follow up with the question, uh, the questioner offline, but I will say CLTC has um, funded some, some great, really productive projects, like um, the one that Allison Post just presented. Uh, we also have a researcher who, who wasn't here today, but who was looking at security and accessibility and mobile health apps. Um, you know, as well as uh, collaborations over the year um, uh, and infrastructure, you know, for example, with the Department of Nuclear Engineering. Um, so, so I agree with Amit, cybersecurity needs to be a topic of research in all of those disciplines. Um, and, and we hope that CLTC is the hub uh, where people can do that. Um, so Amit, I'm just looking at the time and we're coming to the top of the hour, but thank you so much for joining us. Really insightful conversation and um, as always, just love to have your perspective. Thank you so much. And let me just uh, say how inspired I am to be here uh, with your researchers and, and many of them, like I know personally and um, uh, how excited I am about CLTC's work until now and in the future. Mm -hmm.